night, everyone. It is Monday, April 1st, the first day of the last month of the spring semester classes here in 2024 at Middle Tennessee State University, signaling that summer break is not far away. I'm Dr. Mary Evans. I'm the resident professor of history in the University Honors College. And I'm here to welcome everyone to our lecture number 10 in the semester long honors series on mental health and the good life strategies for happiness, wholeness, and well being. And because today is April 1st, April Fool's Day, how fitting that our lecture spirit group this week is here to talk about the Tennessee General Assembly, which we all know is a, has a very well developed sense of humor uh, on multiple topics. And with national statistics telling us that mental illness has increased exponentially among America's youth since 2012 and 2013 when smartphones, handheld computers became everyday elements of people's lives. And with national statistics telling us that mental illness has increased exponentially among LGBTQ plus Americans when legislatures began aggressively passing restrictive gay and trans legislation, as our Tennessee General Assembly has done and continues to do in increasing numbers of bills. And because our Tennessee General Assembly is certain that gun violence in the state of Tennessee is not a military grade firearms accessibility issue at all, but rather a mental illness issue, then logically Tennessee must be taking proactive, potent action to address mental illness throughout and across the state of Tennessee, um, including by expanding, hopefully, Medicaid availability through the Federal um, Affordable Care Act, so as many Tennesseans as need it can get access to that kind of care. So here to teach us about what's really going on inside the halls of the Tennessee State Capitol in Nashville, on legislation already passed and legislation that's in the works is Mr. Bill Dobbins, who's our guest speaker for today. And we're really honored to have Mr. Dobbins with us um, this afternoon. He's a principal and owner of Dobbins Government Relations, which is a public policy advocacy and lobbying firm in Nashville. And for the past 35 years, he's worked in legislative, regulatory, and public policy development for state government and for nonprofit organizations, lobbying on behalf of clients and employers in Nashville and in Washington, D.C., but he primarily focuses his lobbying and advocacy efforts in Nashville with the Tennessee General Assembly. And he has addressed issues of the environment and utilities, agriculture, insurance, and especially health and mental health. And he represents in Tennessee NAMI, N-A-M-I-T-N, at the General Assembly. And NAMI stands for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And if I understand correctly, Mr. Dobbins, in addition to NAMI TN, there are a couple of other large um, mental health organizations uh, he represents speaking on behalf of the needs of mental health in the state of Tennessee. Uh, he was recommended to us to speak today, um, highly recommended, by the director of MTSU's John Sigenthaler Chair of Excellence in First Amendment Studies. And Mr. Dobbins is here to share with us the politics and policies of mental health a report from the Tennessee General Assembly, which is still in session for its spring 2024 session. And he's our speaker today. Um, welcome, Mr. Bill Dobbins. Dr. Evans, thank you very much. And I appreciate all of you being here. It is springtime. And in my spring semester at college, I wouldn't be inside. So I appreciate your dedication. Uh, two other clients I have for mental health is the Mental Health America of the South and also Tennessee Mental Health Consumers Association. So I've been working in lobbying primarily for mental health for the past 18 years. And glad to say that over the past 18 years has been a there's been a lot of change and growth in, in the issue of mental health and public policy. Uh, what I want to do is start out just do some very basics. Uh, uh, again, my, I have um, I deal primarily with the Tennessee General Assembly. Uh, a lot of people wake up, open the phones or news, 
read an article and say, what happened? What happened? And there's an old saying that there are three types of people. People who make things happen, people who watch things happen, and people who wonder what happened. But when it comes to public policy, it's an uncomfortable feeling sitting there in the third category, I wonder what happened. What could have changed? A lot of people will say, well, I want to go, I want to uh, call my congressman or write a letter to my a senator. And that's well and good. But if you're looking for a more immediate impact, Congress is not your answer. Congress works on issues, policies that are years of the development and, and implementation. There are three local governmental organizations that have an immediate impact to your daily lives. The first is city council. The second organization is your county commission. Everyone in their sheriff's department celebrates. And the third is the Tennessee General Assembly. They pass, uh, they can pass laws that go into effect the day the governor signs it. That is a immediate impact on our lives here in Tennessee. So the I believe some of the discourse, bad discourse we have about public policy, is again a basic understanding of how things work, how legislative policy works. So I'm going to go over a brief summary, and I hope I don't bore many of you about this, about how it works in getting policies and bills passed in the, here in Tennessee. And again, if you're not from Tennessee, what well, I'll go over is very similar in whatever state you're from, Georgia, Missouri, Illinois, all except Nebraska, they have a unicameral form of all state government, where ours is a bicameral, just like Congress, you get House and Senate members. So, again, as Dr. Evans said, the Tennessee General Assembly is in session now. Uh, they go into session every year around the second week of January, and they go through about the middle of April. Uh, so they're going to be wrapping up their their, uh, their hearings in the next couple of weeks, and then do floor sessions of past bills, and they should be adjourning somewhere by the middle of the third week of April. And they, again, it's a two-year term. So it's a two-year general assembly. I have up there, it's an old slide, this is, if they're in the, we're in the 113th General Assembly, the second year of this year's assembly election year. Again, in Tennessee, we have 33 members of the Senate. Currently, there are 27 Republicans and 6 Democrats. They elect a Speaker of the Senate. The Speaker uh, runs the, the Senate all floor and appoints all the committee chairs. And again, because we have uh, the, uh, there's a, a large number of, of Republicans, uh, the governor, the Speaker of the Senate is Randy McNally of Oak Ridge, and the Republican Majority Leader is Jack Johnson out of Williamson County. Uh, and the minority party in, in the Senate, uh, Ramesha Akbari from Memphis is the Democratic Leader, and London Lamar from Memphis is also the Democratic Caucus Chairman. And in the House, we have 99 <coughs> members in the House. We have 75 Republican members and 24 Dem Democrats. And the members elect the Speaker. The Speaker presides over the House uh, for actions and appoints all the committees and, and, and chairmen. Cameron Sexton of Crossville is the uh, Speaker of the House. And William Lambert of Portland, Tennessee, just wants the national as a Republican majority leader. Uh, again, in the minority party, Karen Camper is the Democratic leader from Memphis, and John Ray Clemens is a Democratic caucus leader in, uh, in the House. He's from the national. So these are these are these are the players. This is what you have to learn and know that you have House and Senate. And bills get filed. Um, I'm a child of the 60s, so Schoolhouse Rock is one of my favorites. So, um, and it still applies uh, on, how, on how this process works. 
And again, by wanting to look at change, it's important to understand how the system works. Piece of cake, right? <laughs> now this is this is a similar flow chart, but you see again in most in most uh, states on the house. This is a this is the house side, and on the right side is the Senate side. For a bill to go into effect, is introduced in the house and introduced in the Senate, and it goes through different com uh, committees on the house and Senate side. And ideally, they come down here, the Senate passes it, the House passes it, and, 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 the, and the bills have to match identically. The work, the work, wonderful letter. If they do, it goes on to the governor, he signs that in, in, into law. If they don't, if, they don't, if, they, if they have differences, they go to a conference a committee where they work out some mandatory language. And again, both House and Senate bill have to match word for word. So that's why, again, when the legislature starts in, in uh, January, we've had all these committee hearings going on, both House and Senate. In fact, they're, they're finishing out their uh, committee hearings this week. Uh, uh, I think the Senate uh, Judiciary, Judiciary Committee has 102 bills on its calendar, so it's going to be meeting three times this week to go through, through that process. But this is what, this is, it looks intimidating, but once you understand the system, it's not as complex or as intimidating. You just have to run the process, know what step comes up next. And that, again, in order to be, don't be the third class of group of wondering what happens, it, it's important to know how the system works and how you can make an effect, a change, on what is filed, and how it's debated. So, this is how the bill was introduced. This is how the bill was passed. This is how it was implemented. This is what people, this is what people wanted. And that's what that's what can happen with legislation. If you can have a good idea and it can be poorly written, poorly amended. You have unintended consequences. And when all you wanted was just a rope swing, and that's it, or a tire swing. So that's where people like me come into effect, because I'm hired by, by my clients to work this process. I am a venture lobbyist here in Tennessee. So, what does a lobbyist do? Well, my friends think I'm whining and dining all, all of the time. My parents think I'm meeting with the president all the time. And my opponents think I beat baby seals in my, in my spare time. Uh, Sai thinks I'm always paying off folks. I think I'm nobly going up to Capitol Hill. But in the bottom right corner, that is what lobbyists do. They sit in committee hearings for hours on end, for days on end. Because that is the process where you hear debate, where you learn what issues, what legislators will have concerns about different topics, about the topics that you're responsible, that you're advocating. And so it, it's not, being a lobbyist is not all that glamorous, it's not all that nefarious, but it can be really tedious. So keep, keep in mind that when you think of a lobbyist, there's a lot of tedium involved because we're looking at writing laws. We're looking at detail, word for word, phrase by phrase. And also, with a lobbyist, once a law is passed, a lot of times you have regulations to implement that law. You have laws, regulations, and policy. That's how, that's how it works out. 
And so a lot of times we're in hearings from the legislative data session at policy development to, again, provide input, make sure that what is being proposed and regulations to implement that, that law is what was intended by not only what the legislature passed, but what our clients wanted to see done. So it's really, it can be a real challenge. You have all these, all these lobbyists, even as small as Tennessee is, there's, I think the last I saw was five to eight hundred registered lobbyists in Tennessee. Uh, but that's not all, it's not all lobbyists who, who, uh, who uh, uh, make uh, policies. You know, lo lobbyists pay to influence government officials or members of the legislative body to make a decision for or against something. That's what I do. And my direct lobbying is, is influence deliberations or acting or actions by the legislative or government staff with regard to a specific legislation or executive act. So what's the difference is that there's advocacy. And this is for everybody else. Advocacy is the act or process of uh, supporting a cause or a, or a proposal. You're not being paid. But you can advocate for a, a, a position and be, just a, and be just as effective. And again, what makes an effective advocate? Building relationships, the knowledge of the issue, and effective communication. So it's very important if, if, if you have an issue, again, mental health issues. Uh, again, I've worked with three different clients, and they have very passionate members. And we have legislative day on the hill. And uh, and so we'll uh, um, bring the members, and they're not paid, but they're advocates, and they're there to talk to their legislators about different pieces of legislation that, that the file that uh, feel strongly for or against. And we work with these volunteers, these members of the organizations, to learn, to teach them how to be an effective advocate. Now, politics is a, is a contact sport. And I say that, I mean, you've got to be in contact with your legislators to your elected officials. And the best time to get in contact with your elected official, whether a city council member or county commission member or a state legislator, is the best time to contact them when you don't need them. You know, ask them for something. Just introduce yourself. I'm, I'm Bill Dobbins. I live in your district. I appreciate you, you being a state representative or being a city council a person. But it's important to establish that contact uh, when you don't need it. Uh, and so by establishing that contact, also you can tell you tell the, the elected official what you're interested in, what, you know, what, what's important to you. Each year in the Tennessee General Assembly, anywhere from 1,300 to 1,500 bills are filed. And they're all the way from A to far parts to the Z to zoology. I mean, it's everything. And these legislators are not experts in everything. Sometimes they like to give the impression they are, but they're not. And it's constituents, it's advocates such as, as you, who can provide that expertise that they don't have. So when I go in, uh, and uh, we have our, our advocacy day on the hills for my clients, and National Alliance of Mental Illness, we'll have several bills that we're, we're tracking that are important. And these are these are our members who have family members who have had a mental illness. They have had a mental illness. They have been in the system uh, with insurance, doctors, uh, uh, back to work initiatives, and they have that expertise that a legislator may not have. So you can become that expertise, that that expert on that topic for that legislator, and by by developing that relationship following up with that legislator about a specific issue, writing, emailing, calling, you become 
that legislator's expert. Now, I'm going to call Dr. Dr. Evans. She knows all this about this of, of mental health and, the, and, and insurance. I'll call her because she's in my she's in my district, and uh, and and we've got a relationship, and she might have some answers that I don't. And that is how you can affect public policy. <coughs> In this case, with with mental health, so you have these lobbyists and you have advocates. A lot of times, people feel intimidated by all these lobbyists. Sometimes I feel intimidated by all these all these lobbyists. So you say, what can I do? What can I do? I'm just an advocate. Well, this is one of my favorite photos of Tiananmen Square back in 1992, I believe. And there was, a, there was an, uh, an, an, an uprising of the populace, uh, the government sent in military, and this column of tanks was traveling down uh, downtown Beijing. This guy with a briefcase walked across the street, and he stopped in, in, in front of them, wondering what were they doing there. And any time they would move aside, he'd move in front of them. He would let them go around. So the point is that even though there are lobbyists like me who work in public policy, again, at city council, at the county commission, and at state government, and at the community Congress, a single person, a group of advocates, can make a difference. One of my favorite quotes is from Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful criticisms can change the world. Indeed, that's the only thing that ever has. And I'll give you an example of just advocates. For this. A few years ago, I have a friend who's a retired judge here in Nashville. He came to me. He has, he has seen in his court a lot of people come up for him with of minor charges, trespassing, vagrancy. Shop with them. We're, we're wildly acting out. And the common thing is they all had a mental illness. And he said, these folks don't need to be in court. They're not criminals. They have an illness. So what can we do to divert them from the legal system to treatment? So we talked about it. He invited a few other folks in the mental health uh, field. We started talking about what is there a diversion type program that we can think about in to create. Reached out, did some research, and I found out there's, uh, that San Antonio, Texas, Bayer County, had a diversion uh, program that was very effective. So we researched that. We brought in more people, the Sheriff's Association, we brought in mental health organizations, got together over a summer, over a late summer, we decided to approach the Department of Mental Health with an idea about providing grant funding to provide diversion services for people who have been picked up for these type of issues, okay, for having a mental health crisis that are acting out. And the commissioner couldn't help us at that time, but suggested we go talk to the governor's staff, and she would help, and she would go with us. So I set up a meeting with the deputy governor, had the uh, commissioner of finance administration in our meeting, brought in our group of about eight or ten folks, my NAMI members, our Tennessee Mental Health Consumers folks, the Shares Association. And we pitched this idea about rather than arresting these folks, why don't we just put them into a diversion program? And we, we, we were asked how much it might cost. He said, well, we had no idea. We literally didn't know how much this might cost. So we literally pulled a number out of the air and we pulled out $10 million. So it cost to the states, uh, statewide, different groups, different uh, communities. And as it turned out, uh, in order to help justify this, one of our, again, doing your homework, 
sticking point is looking at the funding that had happened for part of mental health. The previous, we did this in, in 2017. I looked at the budgets for the state of Tennessee for the previous decade. 27 to 2007 2017. Over that, over that decade, Tennessee's budget had gone up 34 percent. In the same decade, the Department of Corrections budget had gone up 54 percent. The Department of Mental Health budget had gone up four thousandth of one percent in a decade. So, by presenting this information to the governor staff showing the need, how, how not just that previous decade, not just that administration, but previous administrations, whether Republican or a Democrat, had neglected to do that. When we present this in information to, to the governor's staff, when the governor got his budget a month later, he included a line item of $15 million. And so I'm very pleased to say that now there are mental health diversion system set up in the city of Memphis, Jackson, Tennessee, Nashville, Chattanooga, Knoxville, Morristown, and other, other cities are, are developing these systems also. So again, it starts with, with a group of advocates getting together with an idea, doing our homework, uh, and doing an idea. So that's why you know, it, does, it doesn't take a lot because it takes a good advocacy, doing good homework, doing good research, come up with these, I, these I, ideas. We're now working on a, on a proposal for housing. A lot of, uh, we have a lot of homelessness, not only here in Tennessee, but across, across the nation. And there's a lot of mental illness among the, the, uh, the homeless. And my wife told me that if, if she were living out on the street or in a tent, that'd make her crazy. You know, I mean, it, I mean it's what, 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 when you have to worry about your safety, your care. So, so again, we're working on an idea now of trying to get funding for uh, housing, for homes. Again, we have found that uh, Chattanooga did a program about six years ago where they went to the sheriff's office, they went to the emergency leaders, and went to the courts and said, give us a, the uh, top 10 or 20 people that you see most frequently. And so they got a list of, of, uh, of the top 20 people they see most frequently. Some of these, some of these had records going back for 20 years. Up in any emergency, showing up in the uh, police uh, department. And all these were homeless folks, a lot of them had mental health, some had substance abuse problems too. So, what Chattanooga did, they, they uh, invested money and refurbished an old hotel and provided housing for these 10 people. By having housing, they also put what they call wraparound services. So they had social workers come by and check them. They had nurses or, or, or physician assistants to drop by to make sure that they knew medication. Social workers make sure they had food in, in, in their park. Out of that 10, eight never went back to the jails, never showed up in the emergency rooms, they didn't show up in the courts. Now, a good, for us, a good argument on advocating for mental health programs is to save taxpayers' money. And a lot of your elected officials, their ears will perk up and say, how do we save taxpayers' money? But when you think about it, somebody who's been arrested for shoplifting or counting at, 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 at night while running around naked, you arrest that person, you put them in jail. That's a cost for the taxpayers. Also, when a person with mental illness is in jail, the jail has to provide that, that person's medi medications. And all that comes, the medications, the cost of jail comes down to the local taxpayers. 
Now, who, um, uh, does anybody know what is the largest mental health treatment facility we have in Tennessee? It's the Shelby County Jail in Memphis, Tennessee. They have, I don't know, thousands of people uh, in incarcerated. They have, large, they have over 30% have a mental illness. So the mental health uh, hospital we have up, uh, outside of national only hold a few, of, a couple hundred people. This only thousand, and it's a jail, and that's and that is in every state. But it, but you see, the Shelby County uh, Jail is the largest mental health provider we have in the state, and these uh, the people who run the jails do not want people with mental illness there. Because they know this this is a, a the wrong place for these folks to be when they have a mental illness. People with mental illness are are more likely to be subject to violence than the cause of violence. And so it's important to try to get folks with mental illness out of incarceration. Again, out of incarceration or to avoid it. By avoiding incarceration, you avoid uh, court costs. Again goes out to the local taxpayers do a dollar to have these folks come up into the courts, climbing up the uh, court system. So good mental health policy is not just the right thing to do, but it's also the most effective way to run our government that affects the most people in the most positive way. It helps address people who have mental illness and get the treatment that they need, and it's respectful to the taxpayers who fund the operation of those governments. So that is that is one of the advocacy points that I try to make and my clients try to make when we talk to the local officials. This isn't just a feel good, do good type thing. This is this is good for your taxpayers as a responsible way to use your tax dollars. And that will get them that will get them more interested in what you're trying to say. Now, fortunately, over the last, again, I've been here, I'll do this all almost 20 years, we've had, there's been a greater awareness about mental health and mental illness. Uh, when I first introduced myself to legislators 18 years ago, I represent uh, these mental health organizations, they were very respectful, but I'm able to tell them I, I have a case of leprosy too. That has changed. One last year I introduced myself to 18 years ago. Four years later, there is a to my client. He said, well, I've got a nephew who's got a, who's got a bipolar disorder. And so that was a change in the hardest thing about mental health, and that is stigma. And trying to overcome stigma is, is, the, is the biggest barrier in trying to improve public policy. And I have seen uh, at the legislature a change. Uh, substance use disorder is, 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 a, is a mental health illness. There are two legislators we have here in, in Tennessee openly admit of their prior drug addiction. Whereas 20 years ago that was, uh, that was guaranteed for you not to get involved. But, uh, but they, these are two gentlemen who openly and honest about their previous drug addiction and the challenges and how they have changed that around. And so it's something to be admired. Anytime you see somebody overcome some adversity, it's something to be admired and celebrated. So again, it, never, never doubt that, you know, that a small group of folks who are motivated do their homework, can make a lot of changes. And I'd be glad to answer any questions that you that that you that you might have. Uh, you know, it's your day to talk to a lobbyist. So. What are some of the bills on the floor this session? Oh gosh, some of the bills on the floor this session. There is a bill right now, you know, sponsored uh, really out of Rutherford County, that is um, wants to put on the state's website 
available beds uh, that can take a, a psychiatric patient. This is this came out of a, uh, a, a licensed clinical counselor who had a client who was in a mental health crisis and went to the emergency and sat in the emergency department five days, isolated, took away your phone, and looked up, waiting for a bed to open to some psychiatric hospital so she could be, be ad, ad, admitted. So this bill was, was filed that uh, would allow, uh, would allow mental health professionals to look on the state's website of uh, bed tracking to see if there's a bed available close by and to be able to call that hospital, thereby uh, avoiding the emergency uh, department. And so that, that's a bill being debated this week. Of these three organizations that you represent, what's their wish list? What would they like to see the General Assembly make happen? Well, one of them, uh, a, a big one, as you mentioned earlier, is the uh, is the full endorsement of the Affordable Care Act here in, t in Tennessee. What's the stumbling block for that? Politics. And if it's going to help people? Politics. I mean, do, I, our gen do our General Assembly members not wish to help Tennesseans? Um, they don't think that's help. What do they think it is? Uh, government overreach and, and um, politics. I mean, it, it, it's just, it, it, it is maddening to hear there was there have been some some Republican sponsors of legislation that uh, wanting to expand Medicaid for people who are eligible. Again, these are these are the what we call the working poor. These are folks who, uh, again, and primarily uh, Medicaid or what we call here in Tennessee, TennCare, is available only for limited children. If you're a single man making low wages, you're not eligible for tenure. It's only written for women and children. So, um, so again, the um, um, North Carolina just passed their Medicaid expansion last year. And, and and there are different issues that go, there's a lot of horse training that went involved. North Carolina was like Tennessee, very adamantly opposed to the Affordable Care Act and pretty its expansion on, on, on Medicaid. So uh, uh, one of the issues the stumbling blocks was that this perception that well, people weren't working. You know, this is giving them free health insurance and they didn't, if they only got a job, they, they could afford health insurance. Well, again, the advocates in North Carolina did their homework and showed the Speaker of the House in, in North Carolina the data showing the thousands of people who were working in North Carolina, but their income was so low they could not afford any private insurance. Or their company they worked for didn't provide health insurance. And that was a that was a huge change to show the governor, I mean show the Speaker of the House who was adamantly opposed to it, I mean 180 degrees opposed to it, that convinced him that it was worth it. Now, there were other factors that, that, that came in, in, into play. And under the uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, or, or the American Rescue Plan, which one, the federal government put in an extra sweetener for expansion of Medicaid. And then was, uh, right now, under the existing law, you expand Medicaid to those number of folks who are eligible, the federal government, the federal government will pay 90% of it. Well, under the, under the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, or, or, or the Rescue Plan, they add that to 5% for two years. So for the first two years, local, the state government pays only 5% of it and the feds take 95%. Then after that, two years, they go down to 90%. So a 90 to 10 deal is pretty good. But on top of that, they uh, added a, what uh, I call it, a signing bonus. So North Carolina, 
Now, they approved Medicaid expansion last year. It also included another billion dollars. And what they're going to use that billion dollars for, they're going to get it in, in, in $500 million uh, allotments uh, over two years. They're going to use that money for mental health treatment. I mean, it's, it was like, how can you? In fact, in fact, the lieutenant governor mentioned a year, a year ago last fall that with the changes that were made, that he, he thought it would be good for Tennessee to look into that again. But different bills have been filed this year and been summarily dismissed. The, uh, in some committees, you have to get a motion and a second for to debate a bill. Wouldn't get a second. Uh, and then, why? Uh, Mr. Dobbins, why? Because they didn't want to, they didn't want to uh, debate. They didn't why? Want to, because they don't want it. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Politics. <laughs> are, there any, are there any bills or mental health um, advocacy or bills specifically focusing on the um, horrible after effects of the LGBT um, rights attacks. bills attacks okay. thank you right. are there any bills that are being introduced focusing specifically on the mental health of the LGBT of individuals who are being affected by these bills there's not been any bills introduced per se but there's been in in, in the debate of during the uh, committees that has been brought up and testimony has been offered in in their defense but there hasn't been any bills File per se. Again, if they have been filed, they've been dismissed. Uh, and again, until until Russia is going to keep doing what they're doing because they can't. They will they will only change when there's consequences. And the only consequence they recognize is at the ballot box. And that's and that's one of my personal goal is always to get people involved. That's why I give you the information to get involved. Um, it, yes? So you're talking about advocacy and just like reaching out, you need the best time to reach out is before before you need something. Yeah. I think a lot of students would agree with me. It's a little, not a faux pas or awkward, just be like, hello, you should care about me, my name is XYZ and I do this. Like, are they actually going to read that? Are they going to? No. Okay. You know, it, it is a lot. A lot of a lot of people think that religious don't won't care about me and that, that, who am I and all that stuff. I promise you, you call your you call your legislator. Now, uh, are are most people here from Tennessee? Most, most. yes, most. Um, write down this website. I don't have it here. Website www dot capital C A P I T O L dot capital dot T N dot gov C A P I T O L dot T N dot gov. This is a Tennessee's legislative website. It has won awards for its use, navigability, and you can find who your who your legislators are. Does anybody know who's the senator here from uh, Rutherford County? Shane Reeves. Who? Shane Reeves. Shane Reeves? That's one of them. We have two. Dawn White. Dawn White's there. But it's not Marsha White. She's your U.S. senator, not your state senator. So again, if you want to get some, get some changes quick, quickly, quicker, locally, city council, county commission, state legislature. But you can go to this website, and if you don't know your legislator, in the top right hand corner, I believe, up in the pop down screen, it says, find out legislator, just type in your address. It's like a, type in your, your address in town. And it'll pop up your house and senate member. And you go, and, it, and the hyperlinks to their um, their web, web page on the, on the website, and you can look at all the bills they have sponsored. 
Uh, you can look at also, you can look at uh, if there's a different bill you want to want to be concerned, you are concerned with. Let's say LGBTQ. You can you can pop up there in, 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 in the drop down box, LGBTQ, and on what the bills that are sponsored that have been filed on that topic. And you can look at, you can hyperlink to the bill, hyperlink to the votes on that bill, and see how legislators voted. Now, in the House, is a little different. In the House, in the committee hearings, they do voice votes. <clears throat> Only rarely will they do a, uh, do a uh, call vote. Uh, so, um, so, the, you know, so if it's in a committee in, in the House and it, 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 it wanted to approve, it's just majority yes, you know, and that's it. Whereas in the Senate, it's a roll call vote every time. Whereas in the committee, on or on the floor. Now in, this, in the House, when you have a vote on the floor, then you see it is a roll, is a roll call vote. So you can see how the legislators voted on, on those bills on the House or on the floor. But it's a wonderful website. I think more states are getting these set, set, set up. It's a wonderful website. It's easy to navigate. It puts schedules down there on when the committee's meeting, what bills are on the calendar for that, uh, that uh, committee. So a citizen can easily get in touch with the legislator and what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. And I encourage you and and your friends to get involved and to follow up on Dr. Evans. By all means, I think I saw you had a you had a uh, topic on this earlier this spring. Register to vote and vote. Go out and vote. But getting back to to your question, legislators like to hear from come to uh, cause they turn. You know I said, dear Senator Reeves. So the reason I'm just graduating from the from NPSU, these are my interests. I hope to be able to talk to you at some time. Thank you. That's all. And address, phone number. And a lot of people say, well, if I don't talk to them, they won't read it. That's, that's, that's not true. Can you it's, walk into their office or do you have to have an appointment? You can do both. As a constituent, like I, I have to get an appointment to talk to the legislators. A lot, most, a lot of us have to get appointments. Um, and it takes a week at the you know, at least sometimes two to get a, an appointment set up for 15 minutes. Uh, Grace walk, walks in, and she's a constituent, she goes to get a glass. She's a constituent. Up there. When are the office at when are they likely to be there? Well there uh, during the legislative session, they are there uh, starting the second week in January from Monday to Thursday. Second week of January to the second week of April. Are they in their offices at 8 a.m. like we are? Sometimes. <laughs> Some are there earlier. Uh, I'll, I'll, I will tell you that. Listen. Do you have a suggestion for tiny organizations that lobby on interests that you're passionate about? I'm sorry, can you what? Do you have a suggestion for finding organizations that lobby our state legislature on, in, on things that we're passionate about the topics? Yeah, I mean, um, there is a um, there's another different web, website of all the lobbying or uh, of the lobbying organizations that's 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 registered in Tennessee. So I've listed all of the, or, the, the or, organizations. There's hundreds of them. So um, and, uh, and a lot of them are going to be nonprofits, right? So you can yeah. work with them and yeah. donate and, and right. stuff like that. Right. I mean, it's it, it it's good to call that. That, that organization first. Uh, right. you know, what's what are their interests? How how involved they are in the, in the public policy process? Mm -hmm. Mr. Dobbins, uh, in August, the General Assembly was called into special session by the governor, specifically to deal with what had gone on from what happened a year ago at Covenant School in Nashville to really address um, matters having to do with gun safety uh, in Tennessee. And, and there was absolutely general consensus that the rationale behind any form of gun violence in the state is fully centered on mental health or the lack thereof, which, you know, irony since the lack thereof has 100% to do with the fact that the legislature does not fund assistance for mental health, so go figure. Nevertheless, they met for this particular topic. How many mental health bills were introduced then and of what sort? Uh, 
can't remember the num number of bills filed. Ballpark? 50 to 100. How many of them had to do with mental health? Um, I'd say maybe 15 or 20. Uh, other what were they asking for? Well, some of them were, most of them were what I call bad mental health bills. So I, I wanted to, uh, to uh, defeat them. It was one, there was one, one bill was filed that literally made it a crime for somebody with mental illness to, to, to own a weapon. Now, people who have a mental illness, you know, depression is a mental illness. It doesn't mean you're, you're a threat. Uh, anxiety is a mental illness. You're not a threat. And so there is, there, there is a real challenge for people with mental health advocates to make sure that people with mental illness are treated like every other citizen with their rights. Uh, now, somebody with severe schizophrenia may have, may have, may have but, uh, but, but most of these bills were filed were what we call bad mental health bills. We wanted a, we wanted, we worked with a senator the spring before, right after the COVID tragedy, and trying to develop a logical, workable, extreme risk protection order that uh, would have uh, addressed um, uh, not only people with mental, with a severe mental illness, but also people who were angry, you know, who were, uh, who were dangerous. Uh, well, the, uh, the gun lobby, I mean, Bigfoot at that. I mean, they, they, they made sure no bill was even filed. That would have been a response, what I call a responsible extreme risk protection order, or they call it red flag. Florida has, 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 has passed one, but that was, uh, that, was that, that didn't cut a lot of mustard with these legislators. They passed three bills. In the special session, the other two were two of them were not much, but one was to was to fund the special session because again it cost money. The legislators come in there, you got to pay them the, the per diem. And what they did do, what, what they did do was uh, the House put in some funding for mental health organizations who hire uh, who have mental health therapists and counselors to give them a boost in pay. They uh, put in a boost in pay for the uh, contractors and contractors of the Department of Mental Health for them to boost their staff and to boost salaries for the staff at the Department of Mental Health, thinking that the Senate would go along with that. Well, they did. <laughs> so, they, so as it turned out, the Department of Mental Health got this windfall of about $60 million, which is good. But that was the only good thing that, uh, that came out of their special session. Yes, Mike. Um, I actually worked at the Capitol when this happened. I worked for the Attorney General's office at the time. I'm here now. Um, but one of the things that was kind of infamous at the time uh, when the special session was happening is that the uh, special session hearing on education reform at the time lasted 27 seconds before they tabled it. That's why Dr. Evans was asking that question. It lasted 27 seconds before they um, motioned to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Dobbins. We appreciate your being here.